start the session. Um, please subscribe to the Jaipur Literature Festival YouTube channel to access all the sessions. And if you're tweeting, um, you know, posting anything on any social media platform, use the hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2023 and tag at the Jaipur Lit Fest. Thank you very much. If you're looking for a seat, please find one. I'll start soon. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar Adab. Welcome to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Dettol, Baniga Swast India at Bank of Baroda, Charbagh. We are delighted to introduce Work in Progress, Reimagining Our World. This session is presented by our communication partner, Value First. What does it take to reimagine the future? What does the new world order look like? What are some of the meaningful steps that have already been taken? What's going to change and what's not going to change? As the lines blur between technology, democracy, economics, and geopolitics, and we enter into a new phase of hyper-connected reality, this panel of thought leaders address the state of the world and of the people in it. Can I please have on stage Toby Walsh, Marcus Du Sutoy, Mukesh Bansal in conversation with Navtej Sarna. Can we please have a huge round of applause for them? Don't scream there. We're having a session here. Thank you so much. Toby Walsh is a, professor at, is a professor of AI at UNSW Sydney. He's a strong advocate for limits to ensure AI is used to improve our lives and a fellow of the Australia Academy of Science who was named on the international who's who in AI list of influencers. His most recent work is Machines Behaving Badly, the morality of AI. Marcus Dusutoy is the Sim Simonyi Professor for the Public Understanding of Science, a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and a fellow of the Royal Society. He is the author of seven books and two plays, including his most recent book, Thinking Better, The Art of the Shortcut. Mukesh Bansal is a computer science engineer from IIT Kanpur and a technology entrepreneur. He founded India's largest fashion retailer, Mintra, and headed the e-commerce division for Flipkart after a highly successful acquisition. He is the co-founder of CureFit Healthcare Private Limited, where he's involved in building a next generation health platform that makes holistic health easy and accessible for everyone. And last but not the least, our moderator, Navtej Sarna, has been a professional diplomat for nearly four decades and was India's ambassador to the United States. He has recently authored the novel, Crimson Spring. His earlier books include the novels, The Exile, and We Weren't Lovers Like That, the short story collection from Winter Evenings, and several works of nonfiction. We hope you have a great session. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Whether we like it or not, uh, when we start saying reimagining the world and we are halfway there, by the very fact of the three gentlemen I have on stage, it means artificial intelligence. Where are we going to be in the future? They're going to tell you where the future is going to look like, but I'm going to tell you what JLF is going to look like in about 20 years. Um, the three directors, you know, William Dalrymple will sit in Scotland. Namita will be in Delhi, Sanjoy Roy will be on a flight as always, uh, but we will be met here by their robotic avatars. None of you will actually come here, you will send your little nodes uh, from somewhere in the cosmos who will come here. Shashi Tharoor will not be mobbed by uh, youngsters for signatures of his book, 
something will happen and all the books will get signed. <laughs> Hopefully we'll still get some tea uh, if we come here at all, if any of us, maybe the speakers, and that's the interesting point, the speakers who have to do the speaking and the thinking and the, and the human touch will still have to be on this stage. Perhaps that's what JLF in the future is going to look like. So what is the future? Do we look at 10 years? Do we look at 20 years? Do we look at 50 years? Given the pace of change and given the fact that technology is the main driver, I don't think it can be very much further than the next 30 or 40 years. And our first speaker, Toby Walsh, has chosen a date, his latest book called 2062. I mean, there was a 1984, which all of us know, and now there's a 2062. So, Toby, why 2062? Well, th thank you for that question. Uh, there's, there's two answers. Well, one's a technical answer, a bit, a bit of a dry technical answer, and then there's a, a much more personal answer. The, the technical answer is that I surveyed 300 of my colleagues, other experts in AI around the world, and I asked them the question, when would it that machines match humans uh, in, in all of their capabilities? Uh, and the average answer, they said, was 2062. I think what's interesting about their answer was that no one said it was five years. Equally, very few people said it was more than 500 years. It's sometime in the next century, possibly in the lifetime, almost certainly in the lifetime of our children. Um, and if we're lucky enough and young enough, maybe even in our lifetimes. So that, that was the technical answer. But there was actually, it turned out, a very serendipitous, unexpected answer that I didn't realize when I wrote the book and chose the title. Um, when, I, when the book was about to come out, I explained to my daughter, who was eight at the time, uh, what the book was about. I said, well, it's about the world that you and all the children will inherit. And then I did the maths. Uh, and unbeknown to me, in 2062, she will be my age to the year. <laughs> well, that's, that's as good a reason as, as any. And Marcus, you are the author of, amongst other books, a book called The Art of the Shortcut. Do you think we have a shortcut to 2062? Can it come earlier, this future, when machines become at least as intelligent as men or women? Uh, well, firstly, I must apologize about the state of my voice. Um, it's not from partying too much at Jaipur, although it is all about partying here. So I hope you can hear me at the back. For us, a few waves, that's great. I'll tell you a little bit of a story later about my voice and the attempts to use machine learning to... Um... After, this, after okay. this, tell us what your voice was uh, yeah, good. and what will it, it will become after your recovery. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to... Oh, just stop the dance moves. Yeah. If my voice gives out, I'll start my Bollywood moves. So, um, I think, in a way, this is the wrong question. And I think uh, if anyone went to Toby's session before lunch, he's already illustrated that this idea of a moment when think AI takes over, this what we talk about, the singularity, is really the wrong question. And uh, in Toby's session, he talked about the fact that intelligence is not just one thing, it's not one-dimensional, it's multi-dimensional. And so I, do, I just don't think it makes sense to talk about this moment when AI will be better than us. It's already better than us at some things, namely doing arithmetic, you know, but it's not good at doing maths yet. That requires a kind of intuition it hasn't got yet. Um, it's not good at writing novels. Um, it's good at poetry. So the poets, I'm afraid, are out of a job. Um, but I think the point is that, and this comes back actually to your description at JLF in a few years' time. I think we've all experienced over the last two years a kind of virtual world of Zoom talks and how deeply frustrating that is because nothing beats seeing you in the audience. Nothing beats feeling your smiles, your, your feedback. I think the idea of embodiment is one thing that really distinguishes um, artificial intelligence from, from human intelligence. And so I, I, don't think, I don't think we can replace that. That's something that will always be there and which AI is not good at. But AI is fantastic at other things. And your phone learnt your voice before you lost it. So can, well, we, hear the, can we hear the voice? And that's I thought, I that's thought, machine learning. <laughs> so I thought this would be a perfect 
um, test for the role of artificial intelligence to help us. You know, we have a lot of dystopic views. I wanted to be a bit more optimistic, so I contacted a company called Resemble AI, and I said, can you clone my voice? So I sent them a lot of recordings from a radio program I did on the BBC. They took that as a training data, and they sent me a clone, and this is the result of text to speech using my cloned voice. Now, some of you know what I sound like normally. Um, some of you don't, but this is what I, where's it gone? Joypool, here we go. Uh, I'm in Jaipur to talk about the power of AI to transform the future. I'm in Jaipur to talk about the power of AI to transform the future. Now, if anybody know what I usually sound like, I recognize that. It's not quite me. The intonation isn't quite right. But that's pretty impressive text-to-speech. It, it sounds more like you than you do today. I know. <laughs> I did another version this morning, which was speech-to-speech. Which I thought, you know, so I spoke like this, and then it translated it. But I came out sounding like some cockney uh, kind of rhyming slang uh, lad from the east. I live in the east end of London, so maybe he was picking up that. So maybe you need a better phone, that's all. Yeah. yeah. And Mukesh, you are somebody who's moved from technology away from technology. Are you going to do a U-turn? I mean, you're the founder of Mintra and, and all that, and now you're writing about yoga and meditation and, and breathing. See, very interesting thing about our world is no one can move away from technology anymore. I think technology is catching up faster and faster than we can move away. Yes, you know, I have done, you know, my e-commerce stint when we were working on fashion. Even those days, we were working on things like virtual trial, trial rooms. Um, prediction of demand and supply matching, you know, which involves a lot of algorithms and technology to make things efficient, fast, predictable, cheaper. In my current uh, company, CureFit, you know, AI is a very big part of what we do. We have developed this AI fitness trainer. So the way it works is when you walk into a gym and you answer a few simple questions and the AI trainer creates a very personalized workout regimen for you and, and you what play. The, what are those questions? Am I going to live forever? Is that... No. Yeah, well, I guess uh, maybe we can't answer it now, but hopefully in future. Actually, on that note, you know, one of the topics I'm very interested in just was happening the longevity. And I was just four months ago attending a longevity conference in San Francisco. Some of the world's, you know, best uh, longevity expert researcher there and pretty much all of them are relying on data, analytics, machine learning. Because if you look at, you know, we are an uh, information system. The things that are happening in all of our body at a cellular level, you know, nearly 40 trillion cells and huge number of operations. Ultimately, and I'm a computer scientist, I think um, most of the panel in the panel members here are. So, so much computational data that's in our body, just a matter of learning all of it, recognizing pattern. And today, AI is being used for detecting diseases, for predicting disease. And of course, there are so many, you know, algorithms out there where based on data, they can predict how far you are likely to live. And a lot of people are very hard at work to extend their lifespan. But I think my um, stepping back, my point is that technology is going to be omnipresent in every single thing. I think we are going to be living in a world where everything around us is going to be really smart, observing us, watching us, giving feedback, and it'll be a symbiotic relationship. And I agree with what Marcus said. I think there are so many facets of being intelligent. Technology already exceeds us in many of those. And many of this, it may never, you know, sense of, you know, aesthetics, subjective judgment, emotions, right? So that may be yeah, as long way to go. But yeah, overall, I think um, it doesn't matter what industry one is, technology has a huge role to play. So is, is, the, is the stress then, I think, Toby, you mentioned this in your book, that we stress too much, uh, too much on the intelligence part and not the artificial part? Is it going to be artificial or is the artificial going to tend towards meeting up with the natural at some stage? <laughs> uh, well, just to finish that, the, the last point, which is that there's, that there's a lovely quotation from Val Harian, who's the chief economist at Google, which is, if you want to know what the future looks like, see what rich people have got today. So rich people have got chauffeurs, and we're all going to have self-driving cars. Uh, rich people have got... Uh, personal physicians and personal trainers. Well, AI can give us those personal physicians and personal trainers. So that's a good way, I think, to, to, to see the future. Uh, but to answer your question about artificial intelligence, I think we do get seduced by our 
own intelligence that we always say, well, you know, what separates us from the other animals is we're the smartest one. And that's true. We were, when we came out of the savanna, we were the smartest animal around. And we've used that, for better or for worse, to command the planet. We are badly in charge of the planet uh, as the benefit of, of that intelligence. We, we, weren't, we weren't the strongest, we weren't the, the quickest, but we were the smartest. And we've used that uh, to invent tools and to take poor charge of the planet. Uh, and so I think, you know, we're rather conceited. I mean, indeed, it's, we conceitedly put it in our name, right? We're Homo sapiens, the, the smart species, and rather a conceited name to have called ourselves, but it is correct. Uh, but are, are Homo sapiens under threat? We, well, yeah, we're under threat from ourselves. We're, our, we're likely to destroy ourselves. We're destroying the climate of the planet, which is an existential threat to us. Uh, we saw that we completely miserably failed at dealing with a global pandemic. We knew, we knew exactly what to do. Will machines but, do better? But in our greed, uh, we've, we failed to, to follow through what the, you know, the public health experts were telling us to do. Uh, and millions of people sadly have died unnecessarily, um, let alone the, the long-term costs uh, on our mental health and on our long-term health or the, the long-term impacts of COVID. So we're, we're miserable at, at controlling the planet. Uh, and there is a hope that machines could help us do that better, could help us make better decisions, help us cure cancer. There's, there is lots of possibilities. But, but I still haven't answered your question, which is that um, we should always remember that, that there are many routes to intelligence. Yeah. We're just one of those routes. And there are many dimensions to intelligence, as you say. And machines will have certain characteristics and, and, ex and, and expertise that we won't have. Equally, there are things that are uniquely human. We're, we're the only conscious, sentient being. Uh, we're not the only conscious, but, but machines are not sentient and conscious like, like we are or some other animals. Um, they don't have our emotions. They don't, uh, they, they don't have our empathy. They, they don't have, at least today, our creativity. There's lots of things that humans are still superior at and may always be superior at. I think one thing is interesting about emotion is that uh, there have been some exercises trying to see whether humans can detect a false smile better than an AI. And it turns out the AI, given data of people who are smiling genuinely and people who are smiling but not being happy, that it, the AI is able to pick up signals much better than we are. So we're taken in by the false smile, whilst the AI seems to be reading our emotional world. Yes. It surely doesn't have emotions, but it may be better at reading our emotional world than we are. Which takes us to a troubling place. Well, I think it takes us to a potentially good place because this can be used, for example, by uh, somebody who suffers autism, who isn't able to get in the mind of the other. They can wear an augmented reality set of glasses. The glasses read the, emo the emotional state of the person they're talking to and then tells the autistic person, well, this person is uncomfortable, although they're smiling. So I think you mentioned in the last session before lunch about the you know, AI is a double-edged tool. It has a bad side and a good side. And what we need to do is to celebrate and uh, sort of encourage the good side. Yeah, I think the one uh, relevant facet of this is, you know, it's not all only AI versus humans, you know, AI assisted humans. So let's say I may not be good at reading emotions, but maybe my phone is able to give me gentle nudges as I'm talking to you. So AI can be that, you know, if you, even if AI is better, let's say, you know, reading emotions, it can still help me improve my relationship with my coworkers, colleagues, friends, etc. So it's going to be in a pretty complex network of AI as a potentially intermediating agent, facilitating you know how we operate things. I hope so one day. Still, sorry, go on. I hope one day that artificial intelligence, AI, stops being artificial intelligence and becomes augmented intelligence. We realize we're, we're tool users. At the end of the day, the thing that got us to where we are today was we're the supreme tool users. Uh, the tools in the past amplified our muscles. Now we have tools that can amplify our minds, right. and we should we should see them as as, as things that can can well, take that, us even further that, than that we've gone. That takes you to completely another level. If you have uh, uh, a a being a, a digital being which is which feels everything that man or woman does, and then uh, I mean then what is the role of the Homo sapiens left? Because there will be eternal life, but it'll be mechanical life. Or will our conscience always reside in the cloud? 
I think in, maybe I'll take a stab at it. You know, the, um, the whole concept of agency, right? As a human being, I think, you know, and I think we just alluded to, you know, being conscious. I think today, at the end of it, no matter how intelligent the so-called, you know, the AI is, it's still an algorithm. It's crunching a lot of data. It's inferring patterns out of it. The agency is encoded in the how algorithms are written. You know, it is designed to seek a particular objective. While as a human being, at least for now, all of us can pretend that we have some kind of free will and agency and a belief system that we use to you know, pursue path A, path B, and path C. So in terms of what is the long-term future of the planet for humans as a species, for all the other species, I think you know, until there is a major breakthrough in AI at the next level, which you know, very difficult to argue, it's not, can't be redux, you know, reduced to only computationally derived consciousness, at least as of now. And until you know, we cross the threshold, I think humans will have probably even more profound role to play. I just want to add to, today AI is basically a very powerful tool. That's you know, one lens to look at it. It's enormously capable. It can be immensely powerful. It can be also very dangerous. But who is running and controlling that tool? So far, that's you know, humans and human design systems. I, I couldn't think anything more depressing than eternal life. The beauty of life is its brevity. But isn't you that have what, to get up in the morning isn't and that seize what that Ellen day. Elon Musk wants. Yeah, but you're right, and that's the that's one of the worrying things about AIs. Many of the people behind its development are people in Silicon Valley, people like Elon Musk, who I've had the pleasure to meet, who want to live forever, and that that is somewhat worrying. But so far, I must say that if if Chat GPS is is any. GPT. GPT is, is any indicator, I think it's, there's a long way to go because, uh, you know, one of its cousins, the chat GPT, the program called Cryon, uh, a friend of mine punched in it, uh, I want to see a gorilla in a grass skirt having a ball. So what it produced was a very good looking gorilla in a Hawaiian grass skirt holding a ball. So, you know, it just doesn't, it, it's got a long way to go. Otherwise, we're going to have this gorilla having a ball making mistakes all the time. It has got a long way to go, but, but most people working in the field think it's not, you know, it, it's not centuries, it's in, within this century. Uh, and a, a story I'd like to point out to people was, if we got a signal from deep space, we realized that humanity is not alone, that there are aliens out there with intelligence, and we, dec you know, after a while we decode the message, and we discover it's, you know, it's some aliens from Alpha Centauri, and they want to give us advance notice that they've set off to visit Earth. Well, I, can, I know what's going to happen then. There'll be a crisis. The, the planet will be in crisis mode. There'll be an emergency meeting at the United Nations to discuss how humanity should respond to what we now perceive as a threat. Um, uh, because there's, you know, if they've, if they've got the capability to come to us from space, they must be a technically advanced civilization. And, you know, we know what Hollywood has told us to predict and that sort of setting. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we, that we face the, the prospect of the arrival of a superior intelligence on the planet in the next 50 or 100 years. It's going to be artificial intelligence. And yet, um, you know, we're not seeing necessarily what, what is planning for that do, time. Yeah, if I can pull you in on this issue of you know what happened in the uh, 18th century when the spinning jenny came and people started breaking the spinning jenny saying that this is going to take away our jobs. Some people broke personal computers in the 70s saying this is going to take away my job. Now is AI going to take away jobs? That's the big elephant in the room. I think there's a lot of comparison of this period of technological transformation and the industrial revolution, but I think there's a big difference. It's the speed at which it's happening. The industrial revolution happened over generations. So it was your son or daughter who had to do a different job. This transformation is happening in decades, decade, years. And I think the new skill we're gonna to need to learn, and it's something our education system is not doing very well at, is how to learn. Because everyone is going to have to retrain relearn to do new things. It's quite an exciting prospect, actually, rather than being stuck in the same job. So I think the real difference is the speed at which the revolution is happening. That we're all going to have to be very nimble and change jobs much faster than happened in the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And in India? 
Yeah, uh, just to add to that, I think there is this whole idea of you know humans plus machines, right? I think uh, that's also gaining steam. I think in the past, every technological advance has coincided with definitely you know a certain kind of jobs go away, but different kind of jobs emerge, right? Even after your know, 70s, 80s, you know we have massive IT industry now, which continues to grow. The demand for you know computer engineers is just through the roof, even more so in India. So I think, and and today, you know, AI, despite all the advances, there are a lot of things that a two-year-old can do that AI can't do, and I don't think anyone expect AI to be able to do in next 10, 15 years. Also, you know, being a computer science engineer, you know, I studied computer science in the 90s, and now I've seen you know, the human level intelligence always 20 years out, and that 20 years, you know, despite all the exponential curve of technology, is not coming out. No one is saying now 20 has become 15 or 10, right? 2062 or singularity in nine. 2039, which Ray Kurzweil, you know, made quite famous. But I think um, the the augmentation of uh, what artificial intelligence cap capabilities can do and what humans can do on top of that is where most of the productivity gains for next 20 years. You know, let's say delivering healthcare for even Western world. The whole world is aging very fast. You know, median age is growing. The most countries now people above 40 are more than people below 30, below um, below 40. So hum let's say, you know, human powered systems from population rich places like India and Africa, augmented by a lot of AI, which is monitoring you real time, what's ho happening at your home, what's happening at, um, you know, in your bodies and be able to intervene are some of the systems and solutions we'll certainly see emerging, which is where I think the symbiosis, just like an autopilot, right? You know, autopilots are phenomenal. But none of, us, none of us will fly in a plane without a pilot right now, anytime soon. And we see a lot of such use case, you know, emerge in the coming, you know, decades. Thank you. I'm going to touch on two quick points and then probably open this up. Uh, the first one is, you know, 1984 may have gone, but has Big Brother gone? Or is Big Brother closer? I mean, there's a story about London dustbins were watching people go past and and photographing them. Are, are there going to be, you know, such kind of things happening more and more? Are we going to lose our, our, our bedrooms, our bank details, our everything? Yeah, I mean, Orwell got a lot of things right. Uh, he got a couple of things wrong, though. Uh, it's rather a bold thing to say in a literary festival, but, but first of all, it's not Big Brother. It's not a person watching you. It's computers watching you, because th that allows you to do it at a scale and at a cost that you could not have imagined before. Um, and, and as an example, in China, they have a facial recognition system that can scan a billion faces, so the population of China, in a minute. Uh, and it, just in case you're, you have any doubts as to their intent, they have helpfully called it Skynet. That's the <laughs> AI computer in the Terminator film series. Um, uh, and, and then the second thing is that Orwell got wrong was that uh, if you remember the book, the government forced these devices that were always on and always watching you to be in your house. Well, strangely, unexpectedly, people pay money to put these devices in their homes. It's something like Alexa or Google Nest or Home. Easy device. And people say, oh, but it's not always listening to me. Yes, it is. If it turns on whenever you say something, the only way I can do that is if it's always listening. Otherwise, it wouldn't turn itself on. Yeah, my, so, wife, my wife threw my Alexa into the basement. Yeah. Really, well, yeah. I would throw it into a bucket of water. But, <laughs> but people strangely have paid good money to put these listening devices into their own homes. Yeah. So, last question. Marcus, do you want to take this on and then whoever wants to come in? Is there a chance of machines going rogue? Are we going to have Frankensteins on our hand and what we think we can control suddenly one day becomes more intelligent than us through its own number crunching and takes over? I think the worry is unexpected consequences. So you might write a program that you think looks pretty innocent. Maybe we want to self solve climate change. We think, oh, well, we've got to harvest carbon. That would be a good thing. So the AI says, okay, I'm going to come up with a way of harvesting carbon. Then he realizes, all of us lot are made of carbon. And it starts harvesting us. And actually, we're the problem because we're causing it. So it realizes we can solve climate change by wiping out uh, the human species. So I think it's, that's the danger. And so I think we've been talking about 
it is a tool. I think we've got to see it as a collaborator. And we've got to try and make empathetic AI, which understands where we're coming from, what we want. And in a way, you know, I wrote this book called The Creativity Code, which is about AI being creative. But actually, it's just an expression of our emotional world because it's training on our data, which is an expression of our emotional world too. An AI storyteller uh, called Scheherazade AI was much more empathetic in the way it told its stories because it learned on our stories. Um, that said, we have some very bad dystopic ways of thinking, so if it learns on those, it could well be rogue. I, I'd agreed with Marcus. We, we do face a problem at some point. Machines will be even more capable and we have, may not uh, give them the right values that they should try and optimize for and not think through the consequences that, that um, solving climate change, well, the best way of solving climate change would be to get rid of humanity. Right? We would stop producing carbon dioxide and destroying the planet. That, would, that is one solution to climate change. Um, but before we get, way before we get to that point, um, I'm actually much more worried about stupid intelligence. The, the machines already today are being given responsibilities and they're not smart enough to have those responsibilities. We see that in how the machine learning algorithms behind Twitter, behind Facebook, are distorting our political discourse, are driving us apart as, as societies, are, are flaming uh, fake news and conspiracy theories, uh, and are hurting our, our democracies in ways that are already impacting on our lives. I want to add one, uh, you know, important consideration. This is today what's happening is, you know, most of us are consumers of AI through products or Alexa and things like that. And they are, you know, these computer science engineers with PhDs, etc., who are encoding all these, you know, algorithms. In some ways, you know, any creation you do, you bring your biases, you know, your um, values into it. And increasingly, it's a very small set of people, you know, probably my sense is, only few tens of thousands of people who have a shaping role to play. The policy makers are woefully you know, out of, they have no idea what's going on. You know, they learn about it you know, much when things are totally out of control. So I don't think people are thinking you know, enough about it. How do, in a democratic manner, how can large number of people understand AI at a sufficient level where they are also, because whatever AI does, good or bad, is going to affect all of us. Right, but the people who are at the forefront of driving it, just you know, few billionaires, few you know, technology researchers, you know, few professors, hopefully, and but not too many people. And I think that needs to be paid a lot more attention to because this is climate change. At least today, all of us are paying attention to. We have a voice. We can demonstrate. But AI, you know, most of us are just very passive consumers of whatever is going to happen, you know, which is not a good place to be in. Just to put some data on that, and it is frightening this data. There was a study done by PwC a couple of years ago, and they estimated there's only 100,000 people in the world like me with a PhD in AI. That's it. There, it's hard to think of a previous technological revolution that touches everyone's lives, every, every one of the 8 billion people on the planet, that was driven by 100,000 were mostly white male people like me. Uh, and you're right, that, that is a, a worrying yeah. bias in that. Well, there's a, there's a huge number of issues still out there, the ethics of AI, the geopolitics uh, of AI, what kind of controls you can put in place before 2062. And to find out, out that, there are excellent books by all the three participants here out there. Please go and pick them up and read them. I read about four books in the last one week, and it's been a pure education. We have a few minutes left for questions, perhaps uh, three or four, so I'm going to open that up right now. Please keep your questions short so we can fix them all in. Gentlemen in the second row here, please. Are we entering an age of idiot-proof equality? Idiot-proof equality. If everyone has access to everything. Then everybody is equal. Yes, and therefore, are or we equally entering stupid. an age? How are we ever going to differentiate between each other? And is, is the age of differentiation therefore dead? Yeah, I think my worry is that it's actually reverse. Just building upon my last point, I think people who are who really deeply understand technology, able to translate into products and solutions, are very few and far in between. So everything that's happening, a technological acceleration, is directly correlates with also continued increase in inequality. And the larger technology world has, I think, a lot to think about. Unfortunately, right now, I don't have a very optimistic picture to paint. But I think it's a topic that needs a lot more attention. So thanks for asking the question. Yeah. Thank you.
Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, what I would be worried about is not uh, AI as in such, but who controls the AI. For example, Professor Walsh... So could you Walsh, just come to the question, Yeah, please. Professor yeah. Walsh gave the idea of the Chinese facial recognition system. It is at least controlled by the government, which is in part responsible to its citizen. But the AI that is currently in use... So the is, importance of control. I'll uh, take another one, question uh, there, please, at the back. Yes. We'll, we'll get your question in. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so there was a talk about job losses or transformation of existing jobs. Yeah. So which existing sectors would be impacted the most? Right. One more question and then, uh, yes, here, gentlemen here. Could you give it to the lady there, please? So we get, yes. Hello. Hello. Would you like to complete your sentence? Uh, we, you said we. Can you give it to the lady here so we get? So please, our, no, our please. Gen, yeah. No. The question is that I don't find any reference to issues of privacy, dignity, and human values because all this will require a lot of data, beta testing, all those kind of stuff. Do you have consent when you're mining data? There is, second thing, there is, it's not just a question of invasion of physical space. It's a question of invasion of minds. It's a question of invasion of consciousness. And that is what is highly, highly despicable from point of view of humanity. So, there's lot, control, jobs, invasion of the mind. I'll, I'll take the last one. Um, it's a fantastic question, uh, and if we remember, the world is a better place because of the brave people who thought dangerous thoughts. And they often could do that in the privacy of spaces that governments and other people couldn't surveil. And so I am very worried that we'll go to a, a world where that's no longer possible. The good, I have some good technical news for you, which is I think we're at the lowest point of the technical cycle. So at the moment, if you want to do anything interesting, you need a powerful computer, you need to go up, send your data to one of the big tech giants uh, who amass this data together. Um, but increasingly, we're going to make the algorithms run on less and less hardware. So eventually, it will run on your smartphone. And there are federated ways of learning and so on that you won't have to give up the data. It won't have to leave your possession. And that's the only way you can be sure that you're private. As soon as the data goes out into the wider world, you might as well consider everyone knows it. Yeah, I mean, Tim Berners-Lee is really the father of the internet. He's really trying to make a drive for a shift now that we own our data and you've got to ask me for my data rather than the companies having your data and using it. So I think that's, uh, there is a transformation where uh, the idea of a data commons will be perhaps uh, much more significant. About job loss, um, I think one of the big worries is that, uh, well, it's a, you know, there are a lot of jobs that are going to get lost. A lot of them are white collar jobs. For example, in Oxford, the mathematicians that we teach, many of them go on to become accountants and actuaries. But I'm beginning to tell them that's not going to be a job. That won't be a job in 10 years time, even shorter. But I wrote this book, The Creativity Code, which is, you know, surely a, a creative artists are not out of a job. And even though I would say the top level aren't, you know, the great composers, the great painters, but perhaps the second tier are under threat. For example, composers who don't quite make it, composing symphonies for a concert hall, but are composing uh, things for advertising or for corporate videos. Already AI can do that cheaper and at a scale that humans can't cope with. Uh, for example, music for computer games. You want a music which is gonna react to the player's moves and changes. That's very difficult for a human to write. And AI will be able to write, write bespoke music for each player. So I think that's, for example, a threat. You can see that really with music today. So, you know, the famous um, musicians, they earn a lot of money. Actually, I mean, interestingly enough, they earn most money for performance, live performance. The people, musicians don't make much money from records or CDs or uh, uh, streaming services. Uh, they make their real big bucks from touring 
physical performances. And that's uh, to go back to whether J the Jaipur Literary Festival is going to be virtual. No, people like the being that unique moment in time where unless you were physically in the room, you, you and you, only the other people in the room get that experience and people will pay uh, for that. Um, but the bottom layer of musicians has been decimated. There's much less money uh, going to those people. It's much, much harder to break through. That's it. The control? Control. Who gets to control AI and how much does that matter? I think this is something we touched upon, you know, um, before as well. I think today, a lot of, you know, what's happening AI is really controlled by big tech. And that's why you see also a lot of, you know, backlash against, you know, these companies are too big, too powerful. They control all these massive data centers and the amount of data they are sitting on, which is literally growing by the second. So I think it's a, I do believe it's a big threat to the world. The lot more conversations about is needed. I think the, the regulators and the policymakers need to wake up to this fact and do something about it. In the past, we have so many instances of, you know, governments breaking up these big monopolies. I think technology, they're just starting to scratch the surface, but not enough is being done. So unless some dramatic actions, you know, happen over the next 10 to 15 years, we will end up with a, you know, big brother situation, but instead of a big, you know, uh, government, it's going to be, you know, big companies which are in the big brother situation and, you know, uh, listening to every conversation, watching everything in our homes and, you know, use that data to be able to sell to us, which we are used to. So I think a control is an unsolved problem. It requires, you know, very, very active dialogue and uh, uh, activism on part of pretty much all the stakeholders. So it does not, you know, totally get out of control. Yeah. Couple of other questions, please. Yes. Gentlemen here. I, I think the, I'm sorry, the follow-up can take place outside because we have to give it to a few more people. Yes. So, I mean, GPT, chat GPT, where GPT 3 and 4 are still in the pipeline. Um, the question is, are you, can you hear me? Yes. The institutions, because they're going to be fake dissertations, I mean, the fake expertise is going to hit the roof because of chat GPT. Uh, do you think there's going to be a fall for the institutions that we've been nurturing and fostering for so long? And 2063 follow-up. Are we going to see a uh, utopian world, American presidential elections, and a bot or, bot or robot wins it, looks like Donald Trump or something? <laughs> a robotic president looks like Donald Trump. <laughs> well, there is already a, a um, bot, Deep Trump. Trump is the German family name of the Trump family. Yeah. But they, they tr poured all of Trump's tweets and all of his speeches into the bot. Uh, and, it, and it produces very convincing tweets that sound just like Trump. I know, I know that's not a very high bar. <laughs> but, um, and you can also get um, a Trump voice, just like we've got Marcus's voice. <laughs> uh, and so that raises the possibility of a frightening weapon of mass persuasion, which is you could literally now today r ring up every voter in the United States and Trump could have a conversation persuading them to vote. That would be possible. There's nothing that would stop you doing that today. I was a frightening idea. How many people would be persuaded? How many more people would be persuaded to vote for another Trump presidency? God help the planet if that happens. Right there in the corner, please. Yes. Elon Musk has said that AI, artificial intelligence, is the single biggest threat to the future of human civilization. Now, we may have grave reservations about his natural intelligence, but would you agree that there is some substance in this threat? Who's going to take that? No. No. Uh, no. Short uh, question. Short. There are much greater challenges. The climate emergency, the um, global insecurity that we now live in. Uh, Europe is back at war. Um, the, the, the breakdown in our democratic discourse, there are many greater challenges than AI. AI is a, is a small challenge compared to, I think, to those biggies. But interestingly, Elon yeah. Musk has a solution to that, which is Neuralink, which is his idea that we become artificial intelligence, so it won't be a threat. No, he has an even better solution, you know, colonization of Mars, so in yeah. case things go wrong here, so I think covered we from all away. angles. I think we can send him to live alone on Mars. <laughs> One, one, probably one final question. Yes, here. I don't think you need a mic. Just go. Just 
at a personal level, uh, translators of fiction, how much longer do they have in the job? <laughs> Get your books out. Yes. A, a long time, a long time. Because yeah. it's not just a matter of substituting the correct words in. It's about understanding the, the meaning and the, the motivation of the author and conveying that in that, those ideas in a new language is not something that yeah. AI can do very easily. I think we are still at that uh, at almost the digital equivalent of the moment of a million monkeys pounding away on a million typewriters and ultimately producing the complete works of William Shakespeare. Uh, so there we are. So last question, right there, yes. We've got 14 seconds for question and answer. Right. Are we not overstating the impact of AI because at the end of the day, it's just an algorithm which a human makes, good or bad? Okay. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. L wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. We'd like to thank all four of you, Toby Walsh, Marcus Dusutoy, Mukesh Bansal and Navteet Sarna for this lovely discussion. And please, as a, as a mark of appreciation from us, please accept these calves. There, there.